Texas. Y'all knew better than that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. All right, I like it. <laughs> so in 2013, the University of Oxford uh, published a very interesting paper called The Future of Employment, How Susceptible Are Jobs to Computerization? And the result they came up with was really eye-opening. 47% of all jobs performed today will be done by artificial intelligence within the next 20 years. So in the press, you've heard a lot lately uh, people talking about outsourcing jobs, jobs going overseas. And I really don't think that's the problem. But I really don't think that jobs being performed by AI is a problem. I actually think it's a great opportunity, especially for developers like us, right? So, really quickly, I uh, was going to talk about you know a, a bit of history. What is AI? How did we get here? Where are we going? And a bit about the tools that you can use. And from what I'm told, y'all are all going to get a, a printout, so you'll get a list of links from some tools you can download to get started today. So why are you listening to me? I run the uh, Connected Healthcare Foundry for AT&T in Houston, Texas. We're part of the Texas Medical Center's Innovation Institute. And my background is not computer science. I actually have a degree in philosophy and uh, also studied psychology. Um, I focused on philosophy of mind, artificial intelligence, and logic. Uh, all of the computer stuff that I learned was actually by working at a college radio station. That's also where I learned radio engineering, which is why I'm at at and uh, But by learning both of those things simultaneously, it, it really gave me an interesting uh, background to study AI and to learn about you know, how the human mind works and how we can model computers so that they can solve tasks. So what is artificial intelligence? So at its very basic definition, AI is a computer system that can perform tasks that normally requires human intelligence. Now that leads to another question, which is what on earth is human intelligence, right? That's why I said philosophy. So uh, real quick before I talk about machine learning, in 1980, and uh, uh, just a couple of quick definitions, when people talk about AI, uh, they think of one of two things. Either they think of uh, the movie Artificial Intelligence or Ex Machina, if you like the darker version, or Skynet. Those are examples of uh, strong or general AI. Those are, are AI systems that can perform pretty much any human task given to them. Uh, but there's also, and this is kind of what we're working on today, uh, which is narrow or weak AI, where it focuses on a specific task, right? So if you want an artificial intelligence system that can uh, reroute all the packets on your network very efficiently, that'd be an example of a narrow or weak AI. Uh, machine learning. In 1959, Arthur Samuel defined machine learning as a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being specifically programmed. And for uh, my fellow developers in the room, you know, when you write a program, you know pretty much with a little bit of error checking, what your inputs are gonna be. And you know what you expect the outputs to be. But machine learning kind of goes away from that. It's where you train the system to understand not specific inputs, but it uses dynamic programming based off things that it's learned from what it's previously seen to make decisions on new information that it's never seen before. So a bit of history, I'm a history buff. Um, how did we get here? Anybody recognize this guy, Alan Turing? Uh, he's not only considered the, the father of AI, but he's also the father of theoretical computing. Uh, he's one of my idols. Um, in 1950, uh, he wrote a really amazing paper that's still relevant today called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And in there, he defined the Turing test. Well, he didn't call it that. We call it that because he wrote it. Um, but the Turing test is, if, it's easier to give an example, I think. So if you're on a uh, 
let's say Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp or, or any kind of chat application, uh, if you're talking to one of your friends, you know it's another person on the other end. But especially in some of the newer versions of iOS and Android, you can actually write your own you know, bots uh, that can respond to people very intelligently. You can say like, I need an Uber, I need a Lyft. And it'll look at your location, find the closest Lyft, get it for you. People are able to write really intelligent chat applications. And if anybody's played with a clever bot online, it's it's really interesting at first, you, you're, you're like, oh my, this, this is, you're like, how are you? I'm fine. Um, but at a certain point, Cleverbot, for example, will respond back with just some nonsense. I mean, it, it's just, and that's the, the essence of the Turing test. It's the ability to understand if the thing on the other end is a person or a computer. And it, it really brings up an interesting question. It's, you know, can machines think? Now, Turing wasn't the first person to you know, ask that question. The first person in recorded history to ask that question was actually Plato and, and Socrates. And uh, there will be a little bit more about that later. Again, philosophy. So in 1952, Arthur Samuel wrote what many people consider to be the world's first self-learning program. And what he wanted to do was write a program that could beat a human playing checkers. Now you'll notice when uh, we go through this history, when people started training computers to perform human tasks, it, it's almost like uh, teaching a child. You teach it with, with simpler tasks and they get more complicated as we've evolved this technology. Now he worked on this program and he was able to uh, build one that could play a reasonably good game of checkers just like you're playing a kid. He worked on it until 1970 when it was actually able to beat an amateur ranked checkers player. I did not know that there were amateur ranked checkers <laughs> players, but there are. And what he did, if you've ever written a program that plays something very simple like tic-tac-toe, uh, the way that you would do that, because there aren't many options and there's only X's and O's, uh, you're gonna brute force your way through that one, right? You're gonna just play the game through the end based off every possible move that you can make on the board. Well, as games get more complicated with checkers and chess, and go and things like that, uh, that's just not feasible. You can't expect somebody to sit there for four hours waiting on a computer to pick out its next move when you're playing a checkers match. So you can't do those brute force methods. So he used alpha beta pruning and a min max function to determine based off the entire position of the board, what was the next best move. And it's just fascinating to me that this is 1952, computers filled rooms and it took one of these big room filled computers to play a game of checkers. Whereas now, you know, I have an app on my phone that can whip my butt any day. <laughs> So getting back to my background, philosophy, psychology, uh, Frank Rosenblatt in 1957 started working on, uh, and he actually came up with a theory of neural networking. And that is you know, modeling these systems after the way that the human brain actually works. So building neurons, you know, building multi-layered systems, not just pure, pure functions and algorithms. And he built a machine in, in 1957 called the Perceptron. What a sci-fi 1950s name for a machine, the Perceptron. And uh, if anybody wants to see it, I got to visit it when I went to DC last year. It's in the Smithsonian, it's called the Mark I. It's fascinating. It uh, would fill half of this front row here. And uh, what the Perceptron was able to do, uh, and again, this is the 1950s. You could hold up a geometric object, like a triangle or a square or a circle, and using a camera, it would take a picture of it and tell you what it was. Now that sounds pretty easy to do today, but in 1957, that is some mind-blowing stuff going on. So real quick, um, and thinking of object recognition and uh, my good buddy Plato, uh, that was one of the things he thought that machines would never really be able to do which is recognize objects. He had this theory he talked about in the cave allegory that um, if you think about cats, for example, I love cats. Uh, the reason we can look at a cat 
and know it's a cat is because there's there's this form of a cat. There's this this perfect cat in the universe that all cats kind of descend from. And he thought that a machine would never, ever be able to do that because it's something that, that requires consciousness and that machines could never have consciousness. So, uh, and if any of you took uh, stats in college or university, uh, you probably learned the K-nearest neighbor algorithm. It's, uh, it was written by Thomas Cover and Peter Hart in 1967. And uh, again, cats, dogs, love this example. It's a very simple but very powerful algorithm. And it's used uh, in the early spam classification systems. It's what was used. So if you got a piece of email, uh, you know, back in the day, you'd just get all your emails. And now, you know, you started filtering out spam. You get this little spam folder that nobody ever checks, or at least I don't check it. Um, and you can use the K nearest neighbor algorithm to determine based off examples it's seen before and train the system to understand what spam looks like. Because spam is always changing. Spammers are smart, they're developers too, all right? So they're not gonna make spam always look the same, but you can train a system to understand, you know, what's the essence of spam? What does it look like? So it's really about classifying features. So if you think about cats and dogs, they make different sounds, and they have different claw types. Dogs bark. Cats meow. Dogs have claws that are always extended, and cats have these magical claws that can retract back into their paws and put them on your face when you're sleeping and claw you <laughs> to wake you up, as I found out. So if you get, you know, you, let's say we, we've classified these, these three cats and, and these two lovely dogs down here, and you get a new thing, you're like, oh my god, what is it? Well, you look at the description, and you graph it, just like we love to do. So, and you want to see how close it is to its neighbors. So we've graphed this new uh, little question mark guy out, and it's closer to two cats and one dog. Uh, the key is to pick, you know, a, a, a small odd K uh, so that you can make your circle small, and you don't want to tie, so you pick it up. <laughs> and that's how you can determine based off things that you've already seen, which is those three cats and those two dogs. You get a new thing, compare it. It's closer to the two cats. Must be a cat. Might be a lion, though. <laughs> Still a cat. And jumping forward a little bit, although this research really started in the 1960s, uh, there was, before John Kennedy uh, came out and, and made the great statement that we will send a man to the moon, uh, we were, you know, scientists were pretty convinced that we will send a robot to the moon uh, because it seemed too dangerous, right? It's much safer to send a robot up there to gather stuff and send back signals than it is to send a human and all the, the dangers that space brings, if anybody's seen Gravity. Uh, so the guys at Stanford were working on this, this autonomous vehicle, they called it the Stanford cart. And the, the problem, if you're gonna steer a robot on the moon, is that thanks to the stupid speed of light, it takes two and a half seconds for a radio signal to bounce back and come back so that when you make a left turn, the thing on the moon turns left. Well, if anybody's ever tried to play a game with lag, that ain't working. And if you think about the moon, that's really not working with two and a half seconds. You're going to fall into a bowl or into a hole. You're going to hit a boulder. It's going to get stuck. And you've wasted sending a robot to the moon, which is awesome in and of itself. So in 1979, they pulled off this amazing task. They built a cart that was able to navigate a room with no human intervention, riddled with chairs. And again, thinking about the way kids learn, like if you take a, a three or a four year old and, and have them saunter through a room full of chairs, I'm betting they're gonna bump into a chair or two on their way to the other end. But as we get older, as we learn, you can learn to navigate that seamlessly. Well, I can't because I'm clumsy, but <laughs> most of you can. All right, so, thanks, I needed some musical <laughs> get up for this one. So. The lawyers wouldn't approve this image, but I need you all to close your eyes for a second for me and picture Eddard Stark and that glorious meme that says, brace yourselves, winter's coming, because I couldn't get that image approved. <laughs> so there was something awful. I mean, I think it's awful. It set us back, you know, much like the Dark Ages set us back scientifically, you know, a millennia, we'd probably be colonizing Mars or Pluto by now. 
Uh, but something similar happened in AI research. Uh, in the 70s, DARPA's funding got cut. Um, and they were doing a lot of the, the best research in AI and machine learning in the, the 60s throughout the 70s. Uh, there was a, it was called the Mansfield Amendment. And uh, what it said was, you can no longer do, and you know, I, as a person in AT&T Labs, this, this hurts me, you can no longer do you know, just fun, awesome research for research's sake. You had to have a mission-oriented project that had immediate gain. That's code for military, right? <laughs> and if you couldn't show that what you were working on could pretty quickly be turned into a military application, you were not getting funding. And in fact, Congress said you could not get funding anymore. Um, uh, something else that happened, I went ahead a little bit, sorry. In the 80s and 90s, there was also the collapse of the Lisp market. Anybody here learn Lisp? Yeah, yay, there are a few nerds like me. Um, but the, you know, before it was you know, just a, a code that you could run on anything, there were specialized Lisp machines that, that people sold. And there were very specific chips that could run AI algorithms very efficiently. Well, that collapsed because of the PC. You don't need big specialized computers. You've got you know, the, the x86 processor, uh, you know, general purpose machines, like we're migrating our network to today, uh, that can run things in software and not be hardware based. And you know, AI got kind of a bad name because it wasn't going as fast as people wanted. Um, so people started kind of, as our marketing people would I'm sure love to hear, <laughs> we started rebranding AI. So you heard it called uh, informatics knowledge systems, machine learning, uh, information systems, anything but AI, because you were not gonna get research grants if you called it artificial intelligence anymore. But something amazing happened in 1997. It was a bit controversial, I don't know if you remember, uh, but IBM's Deep Blue was able to beat Gary Kasparov in four out of two games of chess, right? Now, you know, chess is way more complicated than checkers, right? Um, and this actually, the work actually started in 1985 in Carnegie Mellon and IBM bought up the guys that worked on it and, and they built uh, the, the Deep Blue platform and it had a search depth of six to 20 moves. So it could think about 20 moves ahead, which is way more than I can think ahead. It could process 200 million positions a second, which is just mind blowing to me. And this is, you know, this is in the, the late 90s. Uh, and it studied 700,000 grandmaster games, which gave it the knowledge of basically every great chess game that it ever played. Now, I could study chess for years and never really understand 700,000 unique chess games. And uh, the, the controversy was actually a book written by uh, uh, Nate Silver. Uh, they actually claimed, uh, one of the researchers uh, vouched for this, that there's actually a bug, and that's why it won, that when it came to a certain point, it actually just picked a random move, and, but, but Kasparov was confused by this, and he had it in his mind that the IBM guys had come up with this super elite you know, chess move that, that he hadn't thought of, and he got anxious. And he lost the rest of the match, and he lost the next two games. And uh, and he demanded a rematch. There's all this drama. He wanted to see the logs. They wouldn't give him the logs. Um, but as it turns out, uh, regardless of that match, uh, in 2006 they took you know the base code that that they've been working on since then, and instead of running on a you know semi truck sized thing that was deep blue. Uh, on two, two IBM Core 2 duos, uh, the uh, Deep Fritz, which was uh, somebody had been working on it since then, uh, was able to beat uh, Kasparov's uh, kind of successor, Vladimir Kremenik, in a 4-2 match. And that's running on two personal computers. So computers still won. In 2006, Jeffrey Hinton, uh, talked about deep learning, which is a, a many-layered neural network. Um, 
And what's interesting is, is really the concept of, of backpropagation. And it's where, and I'll go over uh, you know, what a neural network is, at least at a basic level in a second, but it's where, where you, you, you run the thing, you compare the results to what you, you thought it would be, you get the errors, and then you run it back through backwards to update the weights on your algorithms, right? So you run it, get the results, feed it back in, run it, get the results, feed it back in, until the machine becomes just amazingly good because you know what you expect and you can continually train it until its accuracy and its confidence level gets higher and higher. And, and how it's like the human brain, and where I think this is really fascinating, is those weights are really the neurons, which are the functions, reorganizing themselves. Just like you can train your brain by doing tasks over and over again or learning new things, the neurons in a neural net reorganize themselves. They train themselves to be in different order and have different importance and different weights. All right, deep learning in a nutshell. So this is a very basic one. So this is a neuron. Uh, it's got a function, it's got three inputs, and it's got you know, n number of weights and an expected output. So one neuron does nothing, right? Bam, this is the best PowerPoint graphic I've ever done. Appreciate it, <laughs> I suck at PowerPoint. Um, but this is a three-layer, three-neuron uh, neural network. It's very basic. I'm not going to go over back propagation. You can read a paper on that. Um, but really, it shows you know, three inputs, different weights on each input, going into different layers, these hidden layers. And there could be any number of layers in there. Um, and again, they reorganize once you put them back in uh, to understand what the input is so that you don't have to specifically tell the program what to expect. The machine learns and reorganizes itself to get better and better at tasks. Um, something that a lot of people don't even think about as, as AI or machine learning is Microsoft Connect. I love this thing. Um, but if you think about it, the ability for a little camera to understand that I'm waving or I'm swinging a bat or you know doing any number of these tasks, you know that took some training. It, it's it's not like there's somebody on the other end watching you, you know, telling the computer what you're doing. Um, it's real time pose recognition. And the guys at Microsoft wrote a really fascinating paper on, on how they pulled this off. But how they did it was they used an extremely large training set. They had lots of images of people you know, in various poses. They knew you know, there's only so many things we can do with two arms, two legs, a torso, and a head. So they had pictures of people in various number of poses, and they tagged it. And they told the system what this is, and they used a decision forest, which is a forest of decision trees. And each one of these trees uh, was labeled to recognize a different body part, doing a different task. And the guys at Microsoft, when they trained it, it had uh, three trees with a depth of 20. So if you can imagine, it's like that, it's huge. Uh, they took a million images to train this system. And it took a full day. Every time they redid it, it took a full day to retrain the system every time they reevaluated it. And that's on a thousand core cluster, right? That's huge. And then, you know, once they train it, they can put it on a chip and put it in your living room. And then, you know, I can play baseball with a computer. It's kind of awesome. One of my favorites, IBM Watson, right? In 2011, we all got to watch Jeopardy and, and see Watson beat a person, or beat two people, in Jeopardy. Now, Jeopardy is a really interesting game to think about because it's not about knowing the answer. I mean, it's about knowing the answer, right? But you can put all the knowledge in a database that we have as humans, right? The problem with Jeopardy is understanding what on earth is the question? Like, what are they getting at? And how do you train a computer to understand? So uh, IBM had a, a project called DeepQA, because again, the problem is understanding the question, not the answer, which is now why when you use a search engine, you no longer have to write these really uh, crazy Boolean, you know, search parameters. You can just type, what is the sound of one hand clapping? And then, you know, the search engine knows to go look for that for you. Uh, well, in 2011, you really couldn't do that as well. And the work that IBM did with Watson really pushed us a bit further to where machines could understand what people were asking, which makes it a lot easier to work with them, right? My opinion. 
So, uh, but again, these are on huge, massive systems. Uh, Watson uh, had all of Wikipedia, 200 million pages, four terabytes of data. It ran on 90 IBM Power 750s, which was like four pizza boxes stacked up, right? 90 of those guys. It had uh, one million books in its knowledge base. So again, it's not about having the knowledge, because you can put all that in a database and make it fairly easy to search. But once they understood how to understand the question, we were able to whoop our butts in jeopardy. <laughs> so, and again, uh, jumping a bit forward to uh, my healthcare stuff. Um, what are they doing with this now is, uh, and uh, Memorial Sloan Ketterling in 2013 has actually started using this for lung cancer diagnosis, and they call it the oncologist assistant. And 90% of nurses who use uh, Watson Health take its advice. I don't know if they take 90% of doctors' advice, but they take Watson's <laughs> advice. 2014, deep face. When I was uh, uh, preparing for this, I, I, it reminded me that uh, 10 years ago, if you wanted to store pictures online or all these image uh, hosting services, we had to pay like nine bucks a month to like store all your photos online. And then all of a sudden, everybody started letting you do it for free. Well, why would they do that? If you're not paying for something, you're the product, right? So they started learning from all of our pictures. So Facebook used a nine layer neural net with 120 million connection weights. This is a massive system. They trained it on four million uh, images and, and facial recognition is ridiculously hard because uh, not all of us you know, are, are face forward like this uh, handsome gentleman here. You know, a lot of us are turned to the side. So you have to turn people's faces. You have to tilt the head back, do the analysis, and compare it to all the other images. Uh, fun fact, the FBI's facial recognition system, when Facebook uh, published their paper on this, was 85% accurate. They could look at a photo and figure out who you were if they had a previous picture of you. Facebook's is 97%. <laughs> Creepy, huh? Um, and that's why when you post a picture on Facebook, now it draws that little box around your face and normally they all already have kind of a, a suggestion as to you know, who that person is so you don't have to go through it. All right, and uh, Robert, I do live in Houston, Texas now, but I was in our Palo Alto foundry uh, for, uh, gosh, five years. I just moved in a, a, you know, June of last year. And when I was there uh, was when AlphaGo was playing uh, its big public match. And a whole bunch of us nerds went to bars to watch a computer play a human in a game of Go. Maybe the nerdiest thing I've ever done. But at least I drank beer while I did it. So Go, if you're not familiar with it, is an amazingly hard game uh, for a computer to play. It's, it's exponentially harder than chess. It's a 19 by 19 board. There are two players. You've got these black pieces and the white pieces. And instead of placing the pieces you know, in the box, you place them on the corners. So just to give you an idea of how much harder this game is to play, um, after two chess moves, there are 400 possible moves you can make, right? In Go, after two moves, there are 130,000 positions you can make. If you know anything about combinatorics, that is a bananas harder problem to solve <laughs> than 400. Um, and, and because of the way Go is, where you capture territory and space opens up on the board, uh, it's, it's constantly that hard. It's not like the problem gets easier to solve. Sometimes it gets harder to solve. Um, but they were able to do it in 2016. Um, <laughs> They used a Monte Carlo tree search, a deep neural net, 12 layers. So Facebook's deep fakes, nine layers. This is 12 layers. So that crazy bananas PowerPoint thing that I did, I was not going to do a 12 layer one for you guys. Um, I know, right? So, um, and they trained it. Uh, they gave it uh, you know, 30 million moves to train it. They let it study every great Go match. And, and people who, if you, any of you play Go, there are replays that you can watch online uh, because people have taken detailed notes of every move that's been played in every major you know, ranked uh, Go game. And this machine analyzed that. Um, 
but what's interesting is what I've talked about previously was uh, supervised learning, right? Where you know the output and you can continually train the machine, right? Because you know what you want at the end of the day. But what they did was a little different. It was reinforcement learning. It's where you kind of, you know what you want in, in general, you want to win, but you don't know at the end of every move what the next best move is. Uh, but you, it plays through all the matches. They had it play itself. It played, you know, forks of its own version. It played against other humans. Um, and by doing that uh, in an unsupervised fashion, they were able to train a system to beat one of us, which uh, in I don't know, 2010 or so, I was talking to someone about Go, and uh, he said that a computer would never, and I mean never, be able to beat a person at the game of Go. I should call him, because that was just last year. Never say never. never say never. So what are the reasons for these advances, right? Um, I mean, it wasn't magic, and maybe it was magic. No, no it wasn't magic. Um, you know, computing got better. Well, A, algorithms got more sophisticated. We kept working on the, the algorithms, and, and neural networks got more advanced, and, and we learned some really efficient ways of solving problems. But other than that, hardware just got amazingly better. So a smartphone from six years ago is the same powerful, same level of power, same amount of flops as a Cray 2 supercomputer. So your phone six years ago has the same computing power as the Cray 2 supercomputer. And if any of you have smartwatches, one of these guys is as powerful as two of those smartphones from six years ago. So you have two Cray supercomputers on your wrist. Pretty awesome. So, um, and that same phone that I was talking about, I mean, th this is a, an amazing amount of operations they can do per second. 34.8 gigaflops per second on a smartphone today that most of you have in your pocket. That is an amazing amount of computing power, and that's why they're able to solve these problems so quickly. Uh, just, I mean, just a few years ago, IBM Watson was 80 teraflops, but again, that was kind of a big machine. But you get what I'm saying. Watch. Uh, so where are we going? Trends. This is supposed to be trends. I've been talking about history for way too long. Um, healthcare. My bread and butter right now. Um, you know, I, I've met a handful of, of various types of doctors in my new role, and I've noticed there's the old guard of doctors who hate technology. They want paper notes, and they fax everything. The bane of my existence. Uh, and then there's the, the kind of the, the, the new guard, the, the guys that love and embrace technology, and they see it like I do as a tool. Now, these things aren't meant to really replace us like anything humans have done since we, you know, grabbed a bone and turned it into a hammer. They're tools for us to use to make our lives easier, to make our jobs better, to make our jobs safer, to make medicine better so that we can all live longer and be happier and stay safe in our homes. Uh, cell diagnosis. You know, if you think about comparing an image of a cat versus a dog, if you can do that, you can tell the difference between a cancerous cell and a non-cancerous cell. Uh, my mom is, a, or was, she just retired, a cytotechnologist in a pathology department, and that's her job. She gets a cell, looks at it, and goes, yep, you have cancer. I mean, that's literally all she does. She marks it, says you have cancer, the pathologist reviews it, uh, but it was very much you know, a human process. Uh, and in the 90s, uh, they brought in you know, this big supercomputer uh, to do a trial to compare my mom to this machine that was supposed to uh, do cancer screening much, much faster and much better. Uh, I was so proud. My mom was like, John Henry, she beat that machine in the 90s. Uh, she was faster and more accurate. She was like 97% accurate, uh, and the machine was like 85%. But today, that is no longer the case. A lot has happened since the 90s. Um, sorry, Mom, glad you retired. <laughs> Um, diagnosis, di sorry, diagnosis, uh, treatment suggestions. 
Um, and this is leveraging all sorts of different aspects of artificial intelligence and machine learning. This is natural language processing. Uh, this is the ability to understand, you know, uh, what doctors mean when they write things. Again, it's, it's about understanding the question. It's about understanding what people are writing so that we can interact with these systems more efficiently. Uh, right now, we're in kind of a rocky time in healthcare where, uh, you know, because of the Affordable Care Act, uh, doctors and, and hospitals and clinics have all migrated to electronic health records, which is why most of the time when you see your doctor now, you see him typing on his laptop or her laptop. Um, and they hate it, and we hate it, but it, you know it's painful, but it's going to get us to a place where instead of having handwritten notes, everything's going to be digitized. And once you have things digitally, you can learn from them. This is going to greatly increase how much research we can do on this. Uh, one fun fact that I learned was there is an algorithm for predicting heart attacks using a support vector machine, which is and a bunch of decision trees and a huge Bayesian network. Uh, I saw a demo of this a few weeks ago in a hospital. If you feed this system from your vital signs, it is 100% accurate at predicting a heart attack. That is pretty freaking cool. Wait till that runs on your watch. Then you'll just go in the hospital and be like, I am going to have a heart attack in two days. <laughs> what a cool future we're going to live in. Uh, autonomous robots. Again, these are things, these, these trends in the marketplace are using all sorts of different aspects of artificial intelligence. I mean, if you have a machine like this, which, hey, speaking of jobs, go into these guys, robots. Uh, Foxconn actually just announced last week that 60,000 jobs are being cut off in their uh, phone manufacturing lines um, and being replaced by these guys, the armed robots, not armed <laughs> arms, arms, sorry. Um, and, and, you know, that scares a lot of people. But if you remember, you know, that job is pretty dangerous. People get sick from the chemicals and stuff. So it makes the job safer. And at the end of the day, you know, somebody's got to build these things. Somebody's got to design them. Somebody's got to make them better and better so that they can be more and more efficient. And that's what we're going to be doing. Or hopefully we will. You know, autonomous cars. You know, that uses a whole suite of interesting AI and machine learning tools. You've got to have computer vision to see what's on the road. You've got to have LIDAR analysis on, on all the objects around you. You've got to have something in the system that can make really tough decisions. Again, I'm glad I studied ethics because... Uh, you know, you're an autonomous car, baby, none, hole in the road. Uh, I'm not making that decision. I'll let the <laughs> Google guys figure that one out. Uh, drones, it's really the same problem as autonomous cars. It's just you're adding altitude into the mix. Um, but it's a scale thing. You know, all those things are going to have to cooperate. So uh, it's not just about one system. But what's really neat about these, you know, once you have a lot of autonomous cars and a lot of autonomous drones uh, performing all these tasks and, and you know, swapping us across town seamlessly, they learn from each other. So it's not just one thing learning, it's all of them learning, combining that knowledge and learning from all of the other autonomous vehicles. Uh, personal assistants, I'm sure we all use, you know, Siri, Cortana, Alexa, Google Assistant, Samsung's got a new one. Um, I mean, these are AI systems, and they train them, you know, they take a little recording of you, run it up to the cloud, figure out what you wanted, answer your question, they keep that recording, it's in terms of services, and, and they compare it to what, what you really said, just, I mean, it's going to make the systems better, and they are getting better and better. I, I'm amazed what you can get voice recognition to do these days. It's a great example of supervised learning. Uh, entertainment, creative people. You're not immune from this. Uh, everything from personalization, categorization, you know, uh, maybe showing you uh, a guide on your TV uh, that's specifically built based off the mood that you're in because it looks at your calendar. It looks at your stress level based off, you know, your biometric data. Uh, I, I want that guide. Entertainment people, don't make this guy. Um, and this was really fascinating. Last year, there was actually an AI called Benjamin that wrote a movie called Sunspring. You can all go out to YouTube and watch it. Uh, it is not the best movie, 
I mean, it's a bit like watching Waiting for Godot. It's a sci-fi thing, so it, it's it's a bit out there, but it sh it just shows the potential of this technology, and it's it's really interesting. And one fun fact is, um, they actually had it write its own um, soundtrack. Uh, security, um, looking at malware. You know, before everything was on static signatures, and now these uh, systems are able to learn. Um, looking at how you access cloud resources. So the, you know, if somebody logs into my uh, cloud account, they can tell whether it's me or somebody else based off how you access files. Finance, uh, predicting the stock market. Although one thing to keep in mind, something I learned, uh, you can never successfully predict the market completely because if you have that knowledge and you use it, you will screw it up because you're gonna buy a stock and it's gonna mess up the prediction. It's a time travel paradox thing. <laughs> um, credit card fraud. I just traveled, and again, I still have to call to let my credit card company know that I'm traveling. Well, this is going to solve those problems. Software development, software developers, we are neither immune to this problem. Uh, there are automated systems now in software development, and I can imagine in a few years you'll be able to use even maybe even voice recognition to say, boop, boop. Uh, write me an app that takes a picture and turns my ears into donkey ears and then it'll just happen. That's a feasible thing that could happen. Uh, so real quick, I'll blow through these because we're running short on time, uh, but y'all get copies of this anyway. What tools can I use? Uh, Hadoop and Spark are the best ones to get used to right now. Uh, Hadoop is the 800 pound gorilla of disk space uh, processing, uses MapReduce. Uh, it's for distributed processing of large data sets across a cluster. Spark is its kind of nimble cheetah-like sister uh, that runs in uh, memory. Different purposes. Uh, I'm a Python geek. Hey, Python. Uh, so I like scikit-learn. Uh, it's based on NumPy, SciPy, and I love Matplotlib that I can never pronounce. And Pandas is amazingly important because you will get a bunch of text that has garbage in it, and Pandas will help you with that. Um, C++, if you're a C++ developer, uh, Shogun and MLPack, uh, C -sharp .net, which uh, these are the tools they actually use to, to develop Connect. So they're really good at imaging, audio, tracking objects. Uh, Java, uh, which is what Apache, Spark, and Hadoop are written in. R. If you know R, you already know the tools. I'm not going to bore you with that. <laughs> so the final question, and something I want to leave you all with is, what do all the humans do now, right? <laughs> well, I mean, again, like I said, we're gonna be the ones writing these things. So, and again, that's one of the reasons I'm sure you've heard, uh, we've been pretty public about it. at and is retraining its workforce. If your job was managing a spreadsheet before, you're gonna learn software development. You're gonna learn to write APIs. We have tons of people in our workforce that are retraining themselves to learn machine learning, big data, we need our workforce. You know, it's not about worrying about jobs going overseas. It's about retraining the American workforce to build and develop and enhance these tools so that we can all have this amazing future where my watch will tell me if I'm gonna have a heart attack or not. So I don't think that computers will ever tackle creativity. And I did say never, so I apologize. <laughs> but there's something there's this creative spark, this eureka moment that we all have when we've stopped working on a problem that we've been beating our heads against the desk and, and we're off you know, taking a bath like Archimedes and you go, oh my God, that's it. That's what we got. So thank you for listening to me. I'm sorry I did not leave enough time for questions. You got my Twitter, at Reverse Gremlin. I'll be out in the uh, lobby if you have any questions. Thank you for listening to me. Great job, Nadia. Um, I love that history taking us through where